Welcome everyone. My name is Namal De Silva and I'm the Chief Diversity Officer at the American Bird Conservancy. I'm so pleased that you're joining us for the third episode of our BirdAbility Birders series, which is co-hosted by ABC and by BirdAbility to support birders with disabilities and other health concerns. We at ABC are very happy to be able to support BirdAbility as they expand their work. Here's a bit more about our two organizations. American Bird Conservancy works with partners throughout the Americas to halt extinctions, safeguard habitats, and build capacity for bird conservation. We want more people to enjoy and care for birds and the environment, including people who have been historically ignored within the conservation field. BirdAbility is a new organization that uses education, outreach, and advocacy to make the birding community and the outdoors more welcoming, inclusive, safe, and accessible for everybody. BirdAbility focuses on people with mobility challenges, blindness or low vision, chronic illness, intellectual or developmental disabilities, mental illness, those who are neurodivergent, deaf, hard of hearing, or have other health concerns. In addition to current birders, BirdAbility strives to introduce birding to people with disabilities who are not yet birders so that they too can experience the joys of birding. Now, let me introduce you to our speakers and our team. Our guest today is Leticia Suarez. Leticia is an ornithologist and postdoctoral associate at the Advanced Faculty for Avian Research at Western University. She was co-chair of the joint meeting of the American Ornithological Society and Society of Canadian Ornithologists in 2021. Throughout her career, she's done field research with birds from the Amazon, the Amazon forest in Brazil, where she's originally from, the Caribbean and the mixed forests in Ontario. She has battled fibromyalgia for eight years and is currently learning to live with long COVID, which causes chronic pain, fatigue, brain fog, among other symptoms. She considers herself a non-traditional birder and is passionate about making birding and ornithology more inclusive and accessible. Our co-host, Freya McGregor, is the birdability coordinator and serves as the interviewer for all six webinars. Freya is an occupational therapist and her experience is with modifying the physical and cultural environments of people, adapting tasks and equipment to enable participation and developing public health programs to help. And all of this helps guide BirdAbility's overall approach. Her background is in blindness and low vision services. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Me. Let's get into it. Leticia, uh, so glad you're Hello. here. I'm so looking forward to talking to you tonight. Um, please introduce yourself with your name, your pronouns if you like, um, where you are, and um, a little bit about your access challenge or challenges. Yeah. Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming here tonight. I'm super excited to share some of my experience with you. It's definitely a complex topic and I'm, I'm very nervous <laughs> actually. Um, so here we go. Yeah, let's do this. So my pronouns are she, her. I am currently speaking uh, from the land of the Patasha indigenous people in Northeast Brazil. It's uh, the region now uh, known uh, as the state of uh, Bahia. Um, I'm in a region of the Atlantic Forest, uh, exactly where the Portuguese uh, have invaded uh, Brazil uh, and began colonization. So it's a, it's a very important place uh, historically, uh, ecologically, culturally uh, for us. And I would like to use this moment too to thank my hosts on this land and my tutors. So thank you very much. Um, so a little bit about my access challenges. I have a little bit of a before and after COVID-19, right? So before COVID-19, um, I had been living with a diagnosed of fibromyalgia. And I say diagnosed because I can identify episodes before the diagnosis, but I, I didn't really, you know, knew what it was, couldn't figure it out, uh, flares and things like that. Um, until I was in, in graduate school in 2013. And I had a major flare that completely affected my mobility and the, put me mostly bedridden for uh, about seven months. Um, 
And it was when I was diagnosed and was when I also realized that I had very bad for a long time and was put on right treatment for fibromyalgia and realized, wow, I can thank, that's amazing. Um, so there was a lot of uh, management uh, changes in lifestyle that I did to manage my fiber after I got the diagnosis and that empowered me you know, to search more uh, for answers. And I had worked uh, intentionally on that uh, for a long time with uh, a lot of contact with nature and birds being uh, uh, mostly at the forefront of this uh, treatment that you know, I um, came up for myself that uh, worked out over the years, right? Um, and then came in COVID-19 and I thought that even though I struggled uh, with health concerns, I, I had a sense, you know, that a bliss sense that you are in control of this package here. <laughs> But uh, COVID-19 came and, and told me, no, you're not. You're absolutely not. So I got sick uh, on April 12, 2020, and I never recovered. And uh, I passed the acute phase of COVID-19, and my illness turned into something else and morphed into the months, uh, throughout the months, into a multi-system beast. So I'm a basically on the umbrella of just like chronic illnesses in, in a trench coat. <laughs> that's, that's how I describe myself right now. Um, and it's extremely challenging to manage. It has uh, flared my fibromyalgia. So I deal with a lot of pain. I deal with a lot of uh, joint problems. Like I have this uh, constant feeling of my joints being like cemented. Um, so I have to pay attention to, you know, slope of the rain now. <laughs> is there, is that like a stable surface so for me to step on because my, my stability is not the same. Uh, so I'm more accident prone uh, because of that. Uh, but the hallmark of things, uh, of symptoms that I have is a, it's a symptom that's called post-exertional malaise. Uh, that really makes everything extremely complicated to handle. Uh, so that's the worsening of symptoms, uh, and it means like pain, fatigue, brain fog. Uh, if you uh, spend more energy than your energy tolerance threshold, let's uh, put it like that. Uh, so you have to really change your life and your lifestyle around managing the energy budget that your body can handle. And that really affects uh, things that uh, I did before to take care of my, my, my mental health and to manage my fiber as well, my profession, my personal life. You know? So it's, it's a complete life overhaul, I think, that uh, this disease sure. forces you. Sure, sure. So before we go back to that, um, let's circle back a little bit to how you um, found birds and birding, and what what is it about birds and birding that that you like that makes you that um, keeps you enjoying this hobby and this profession as an ornithologist? Yeah, I think birds. I I call them tiny battery packages of wonder because. I think I will never cease to be amazed by them and even by the, the simplest, not the simplest, the, the most common species that we see on our everyday lives because there, there, is, there is always something that they offer in terms of just how they handle things. You know, I, I, I'm really fascinated by, by resilience, but by what they are capable of doing, I find that absolutely amazing that, you know, I'm here seeing ruddy turnstones and in a few months, they're going to go up to the, uh, to Canada to lay eggs. And it's just, it's my blow, you know, that that little thing can do this uh, back and forth every year. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> oh yeah. Very it's totally cool. amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, actually, yeah, but, there's not uh, many, sorry. 
but what got me started, right? Uh, I, I always, when I was in college, I was always into ecology and being outside, you know, outdoors, nature, always being something that has uh, helped me uh, and has helped my mental health. Um, and, but I never thought the birds were for me because, you know, I had so many other things to be concerned about that I would see people going on bird outings in college and I'm just, I don't have time for that. I, I have to manage work, I have to manage classes and, and other responsibilities. And then I got into grad school and had a chance to go to the field with a few ornithologists and I'm like, wow. Birds are so cool. And then I got just absolutely hooked into them. And then it's just, that's what I want to do. And yeah, here I am. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. Yeah, I was I was gonna say there's not many birds shared between North or South America and Australia, but there are ruddy turnstones here in Australia every now and then. So um, uh, these little birds fly a really long way. I um, know. And so how there are lots of different ways to enjoy wild birds and many people often think of birding involving walking down a trail. Um, that's not the only way to do it though. How do you go birding? How do you enjoy wild birds? That's a great question. So my disability is what is called a dynamic disability um, because long COVID is a chronic illness that is a spectrum chronic illness, right? And it's a relapsing remitting chronic illness as well. So you have people that have, you know, deal with a different number of symptoms and intensity of symptoms, as well as the symptom cycle, sometimes within the day, sometimes like throughout the week. Um, so because you can be well, in one day and completely bad reading and uncomfortable on the next, you gotta be creative, right? Uh, to keep doing the things that you love. Um, and so when I got, um, uh, I realized, you know, that I was not going to recover, fully recover from uh, COVID-19, um, it, I grieved a lot of the loss of the habits, you know, like all of the, the, the things that I used to do that would help me, help me physically, help me mentally. And birding was one of them. And there was a lot of loss of uh, independence uh, because my partner who is also my caretaker is also a long hauler. So we have to manage, you know, our family dynamics so we can accommodate uh, each one of our habits, uh, you know, and take care of our health. Um, so I, when I was spending a lot of time in bed, I really, really missed this contact with the outside. So the first thing I did, I repositioned my bed in the bedroom so I could face the window. And luckily, <laughs> I had this really big and beautiful oak tree outside of my window. And that just became my world, you know. And, and I knew just every single detail about that tree. And I watched so many birds uh, visit that tree. And, and it was just, you know, just those details, you know, it's just, it's just like almost like fractals, you know, just uh, expanding in, in details. Uh, and sometimes uh, because um, of this differences in intensity of symptoms, um, I had bad flares of, of lung COVID in which I had a lot of uh, noise uh, sensitivity and that light sensitivity. So I had to be in a dark room with headphones, you know, very little light, dim light and a little stimulation, but I could tolerate turning on a bird cam and, and no volume and watching birds. And that really helped uh, me relax, give me comfort in moments that, you know, there's a lot of pain, there is a lot of discomfort, there is a lot of grief, you know, that you have to endure. So yeah, there is- Yeah, that's amazing. 
there is no right way, you know, I think. Well, there's many there's right no ways. Right. And and I think that's the that's one of the really cool things about birds is that you don't have to necessarily go on this epic quest to find them. They often come to you and having a tree in the backyard or or being able yes. to beam in birds on a webcam. Um, folks, if you know of any webcams you love watching, um, share them in the chat so others can um, can tap into them. The Cornell Lab of Ornithology have a lot of webcams. Um, they have ones in West Texas full of hummingbirds. They have ones from Panama with these big fruit feeders and all these. Yeah, birds the Panama Panama coming. Fun. Yeah, I mean, what an amazing thing to do. And Leticia and I were talking about um, how amazing it would be if more healthcare providers and workers in, you know, aged care facilities and rehab hospitals set up webcams for, for patients um, just as a, a connection to the outdoors and to birds and the world outside of where they're currently being kind of stuck um thank you yeah what a fantastic way to enjoy birds even even um when you're so um limited by what your body's letting you do um yes yes and and i think the even the use of binoculars for birding some people have a really hard time um with the, the amount of sensory input that uh, the image of the binoculars, uh, you know, you have to just balance, you have to, you know, focus and you have to adjust depth. And sometimes that, that is, that, that can be a lot uh, for uh, someone dealing with, you know, energy budget or even the sensory stimuli. And so we need to, I think distance ourselves from this idea that you ought to have optics, you ought to have this, you know, all this fancy equipment, you know, to go out and watch birds or, or listen to them and, and enjoy them. Yeah, absolutely. You don't, you absolutely don't need to have binoculars to be a birder or to enjoy birds. And that's something I saw that there are a few folks here leading um, accessible outings and so on. Um, in, I saw it in the chat. Um, yeah, not emphasizing the need for binoculars is a really important thing we can do to be more inclusive of folks who bird in different ways or who can't lift binoculars. They don't have the upper body strength or, or, or they can't deal with looking through binoculars. Um, Birding by ear is a great way to enjoy birds that doesn't involve things that are heavy, hard to manage, maybe too expensive, yes. you know, all these different things. Yes. Um, that doesn't make you not a birder. They're just a tool yes. that is helpful for some people. Yes. Um, so um, when you're, if you, if you were birding out, you know, outside somehow, um, how does your, how does fibromyalgia and now also long COVID um, impact the way that you go birding and what do you do to try and um, work around that like using binoculars or not maybe not the binoculars or or taking rest breaks things like that what what strategies and what tips and tricks do you have um, for other folks who um, who may have similar chronic illnesses um, for to help that help you go birding yeah so I um I do a lot of birding within a block of my house. <laughs> uh, right now, I am currently in a, in a phase that I have a decent uh, mobility. I, I'm, a, I'm able to be a little bit more independent uh, on my own. Uh, some days I do need a cane, for example, and I'm, I do not bring a binoculars. It's just it's too much for me. And sometimes with fibro, I have a lot of hand pain, uh, hand tingling, just hands are uncomfortable. I, I don't want to be doing this. I don't want to be doing that at all. Uh, so I just, I just let go of that. And I just walk in a very slow pace, very calmly. I let go of... Um, being too concerned about taxonomy and ID because of sensory overload and information processing overload. I just, it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a meditation. I just try to be there with them and just make that connection. And just, what are they doing, you know? What is, oh, look at this, uh, you know, how, how, how would I describe the song in the air? Just, just you know, 
you be be creative in that moment um, and and use that you know for myself uh, just uh, to recenter myself. So I use it a lot of uh, as a tool for you know meditation, um, and it it really depends on how I bird, it really depends on the symptom that I'm flaring the day. So if mobility is a challenge, I bird from home. I sit in my backyard, you know, and I just watch birds if I can handle a binoculars. I I will use them. Sometimes I make videos with my phone because it's just, it's, it's nice, you know, it's easier than binoculars. Um, so it's, I, I just, reached the point that you know there are no rules for birding for me you know? yes so whatever yes. way I want to do it uh, whatever way I can do it in the moment because it's such a dynamic disability um, I will do it you know and I will try to enjoy that yeah amazing amazing um yeah and and I, I know a lot of folks don't necessarily realize that you know there's D disability is so diverse and even with within one diagnosis people are diverse yeah. and then even within one person your 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 needs and your kind of capacity each day changes and even within yeah. the day you said and and a lot of people yeah. don't realize this and they might see maybe someone sees you out with a cane one day and then without a cane the next day that doesn't mean that you are faking it or that you're magically healed yeah, it's just exactly it's just yeah. what you're living with um, or it's a fashion statement, which there you I've go. heard before. <laughs> yeah, you can. I've seen some beautiful canes, like purple and like sparkly canes. Yeah, you can, yeah absolutely. Yes. So fun. <laughs> um, do you do you find if you so you said you walk around the block and you go slowly? Um, is is having rest slowly. breaks important or like having benches? Yes. You know, just sit so on. Is I know one? there are two things that are very three things. First, the slope of the terrain is extremely important to me because of my ankle mobility. Um, it's, it's a strategy to avoid injury because I have injured my, both my ankles multiple times. Um, so I need to pay attention to that. The second thing is places to sit down and sit down in shade. Uh, that's very, very, very important. Uh, Heat intolerance is a problem um, for, in my case. Um, so, because with fibro and long COVID, I have terrible, terrible sleep. Um, I still struggle a lot with sleep. So I manage my sleep that I, I try to go to bed very early. And I wake up at 3 a.m. usually. So I go birding very early. <laughs> But at the same time, temperature-wise, as it is with my body, it tolerates uh, uh, better in, in the climate that I'm living now. Uh, when I was in Canada, I um, was very tolerant to cold as well. And heat, just the extreme temperature range is uh, it's very uncomfortable. So just no burning outside. Let's mm -hmm. do some birding out the window. Yeah, uh, yeah. So this yeah. this type of decision making process that you know I have to um, to do, and uh, definitely it's not something that uh, a birding and outing is not something I can do every day. I need to pace myself very well. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, twice a week, three times a week, you know. Mm -hmm. a good week that I can do this around the block. Mm -hmm. Sure. And yeah, you, you mentioned shade. I know a lot of people with um, chronic illnesses like uh, multiple sclerosis and, and lupus, particularly um, not just uh, those folks don't necessarily only have difficulty with heat and and keeping themselves their bo their bodies have a hard time with heat regulation but but also just yeah. direct sun makes things really hard mm -hmm. and so shade shade is actually an access consideration in outdoor spaces and um if if folks if you're interested in learning more about that what makes a truly accessible birding location there is a big um web page on the birdability website 
um, called Access Considerations. And there's a lot of detail about things like shade and benches and trail surfaces, um, slope. You mentioned all of these things. Um, a lot of different people with a lot of different access needs benefit from this stuff. Um, benches. Oh, my gosh. I, 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 I'm sure we need to start a hashtag about burning from benches uh, on social media. Oh, benches. Benches is just absolutely such a need everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so we sort of touched on this, but someone sent a question in ahead of time, and I thought it was a really great, great question. We sort of touched on it already, but um, the question was, have you found a way to enjoy birds on days when your pain or fatigue are so bad that you don't have the energy to walk down a trail? And you mentioned just walking around the block or burning from your backyard yes, or burning yes. from your window. Yes, I... So the, the birding from the window uh, really got me thinking uh, because I was, I was forced, it was migration time when I first got sick and I was just, oh my God, I'm going to miss migration. It was so terrible. <laughs> so I just sat by the window um, and, and I'm like, I'm going to give this a try and just see how it goes. And uh, my neighbors could see me sitting by the window with binoculars see. I'm sure they thought it was extremely strange, <laughs> but I, I had the privilege to live in a neighborhood that had lots of you know, mature trees. And uh, that brought in a good amount of diversity. And, and also I had the privilege to have a backyard who had lots of trees as well. Um, so I think the fact that I was not, you know, in an apartment building complex, and in a place, you know, with a lot of concrete, uh, there, there, there are access, cha access challenges to birding, if, even if you're trying to bird from home, you know. And, and I think people need to consider that, you know, like, what can we do for folks who are homebound? Who are just so many people are homebound because of chronic illness and disability, even before the pandemic, and now it's, it's a reality for millions of people. Um, so we, we ought to do better, you know, in terms of the uh, health planning of our neighborhoods to think about these folks that, you know, have this reliance on uh, green spaces that are immediate, you know, that they can't just get a car and, and go somewhere else. Yeah, and you, you and I were talking before about, um... You know, that urban planning, um, having native trees and plants in the neighborhood, even if someone can't maybe afford or is able to, they can't afford a feeder or bird feed, a bird seed, or they can't physically fill the feeder up themselves. But if there's lots of native plants in the neighborhood, hopefully there'll be a lot of birds passing through and they exactly. can enjoy them anyway. And that's something that can be done, you know, on a higher level, but has positive impacts on everybody. Um, living there, yes. let alone the birds, you know, who now have some more habitat. Um, exactly. Can we please stop raking our leaves? <laughs> right. Leave your leaves in place. Leave the leaves. Leave <laughs> the, the birds leaves. will benefit from it. Yes. Really simple yeah, things yeah. like that, you know. There's so much. Yeah. And, and getting involved, maybe if, if you live somewhere and there's a local park or a local creek where there's, you know, people are doing revegetation efforts and, you know, you getting involved in that might be helping your neighbours, you don't even know, who have chronic illnesses, who, who are really exactly. old, who that can, can enjoy birds that way because you're helping create this habitat in the, in the community. Um, so, so you're an ornithologist, it's your job as well as, as, well as your hobby. Um, but chronic illness can make things challenging in workplaces. So um, some, I know some workplaces are really supportive and managers and colleagues and some maybe are not. So what, what's your ideal, what would your ideal workplace look like supporting you um, as an employee with two chronic illnesses? Yeah, I think in general, uh, people can benefit a lot from having their employers just give the opportunity for them to be heard and take in what they need, what their needs are, what their needs are, you know, uh, just believe people when they tell you what they need. And I think it's, 
it's it's very simple and um people are eager and they are their happiest when they can express their true selves and be their true selves and being able to say i am disabled and these are my needs and have these needs match is is something that is a human right. It's a basic human right. And I, I think it, it boils down to something that's just so simple. You know? Sure. I, I know things like um, allowing multiple rest breaks throughout the day, you know, not pushing someone to work nine till five with a 30 minute lunch, yes. but letting people, maybe they're working from eight till six, but they have a few half an hour breaks, things like that. Exactly. Just, like it's it's not that difficult really that's that shouldn't be that hard to implement in a workplace but but the workplace being supportive of that kind of need and um yes. maybe I, adequate sick leave for example mm -hmm. and um yes. if you if you just yes. exhausted you, there's no point you coming to work you're going to be even worse for the rest of the week right if you push over yes. you said your your activity tolerance like if you go over that the the outcome is even worse for you absolutely yes yes and i can i mean i i, I have um i'm i'm evolving i think my relationship with productivity has changed has been changing a lot so because of the severity of my chronic illness and i have been forced to, to really adapt my life and completely change my life to accommodate what my body can do and that makes you realize as well how much you put your value into how much you can produce in terms of you know work output and sometimes you start paying attention in how much time you put into tasks that are actually just futile, you know, they, they, they add nothing to no one, not even yourself. Um, so I think having my body tell me, you know, you have to stop, you have to, you have to slow down, stop, pace, and you have to rest and give uh, your body chance to heal. Um, showed me that you know i am capable of doing many things given the right conditions for me to do these things you know but if these conditions are not matched yes it, it will be extremely challenging for me to you know be productive uh, in a, in a able-bodied perception of uh, productivity yeah absolutely yeah, I, I imagine that's a, um, like a lot of the things you've talked about, it's, it's one thing to kind of mention, oh, you've had, you have to adjust to that. I imagine it's a lot more difficult going through that and, you know, taking that in and, and giving yourself that um, grace to be different yeah. and to have different needs and to have a different, a different life than, than what maybe you had before or what other people might expect from you um, and being able to say, no, like, I can't, I can't do that. I don't have that's that doesn't fit for me right now and I have to look after myself first before I do anything else yes yes exactly yes oh, and, yeah. and and with with long COVID it's it's very 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 tricky to adapt and that is true for uh myalgic encephalomyelitis for example with, uh that has the hallmark symptom of a post-exertional malaise, this exacerbation of symptoms if you pass any activity threshold. And this is an illness that, you know, it's been there before the pandemic. It's uh, not, it, it hasn't been given the attention that it deserves uh, and now, you know, we have this mass uh, disabling event of the pandemic, like really just showing people that you need to pay attention to post-infectious illnesses, right? You need to uh, give people what they need to recover when they get sick. You can't really push people 
into a complete crash. And we need to be also harnessing the power of, of nature and, and, and birds and, you know, just reconnect with the environment to really heal ourselves. I think that's very important to be intentional in doing that. Yeah, yeah, and 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 because I know there's a few folks in the in the chat who um, leading outings and stuff, um, organize bird related programs like big sits um, where you're not moving down a trail. Where people can come just for an hour and then go home, and you're sitting still, um, or or um, including some programming around mindful birding. Um, we have a page on the Birdability website about mindful birding. There's resources up there. There's lots, lots more coming out about that, you know, using birds as meditation and, and a self-care um, strategy. Um, there's, as, as well as if you, I mean, there's nothing wrong with listing, but that might not be the way you want to enjoy birds chasing and, and um, you know, cruising around at high speeds. Um, so now you mentioned, you mentioned having... Um, you said you said mass disabling event. So we know that language is really important, and it can include or it can alienate people if someone uses the wrong word. And language is always evolving, and things are changing. Um, I know historically, handicapped was a word that's often used, and these days, many I know many people in the disability community um, find it outdated and and, and offensive even. Um, some people though are really worried about calling someone disabled in case that's offensive and so um do you do you identify as being disabled and um and do you do you think that that word is is kind of offensive or is there another word you would rather use or and what's your feeling about the word disabled and disability yeah i i 100 percent identify as being disabled i i think it's a very necessary conversation um, to have on what it means to be disabled because we are the most diverse minority group. You know? So there is no right or wrong way of being disabled or no uh, stereotype of being disabled. But the, there is a common thread that there are things that limit us. Um, and have needs and so we need to communicate those needs and, and have be given the opportunity to communicate these needs and have this needs met right um and before long covid i was disabled however i had so much internalized ableism even though you know i i I accumulated diagnosis like through all the years, IBS, here, depression, anxiety, and then fibromyalgia, and had all of these difficulties and had to make lots of, you know, access considerations, but I did not see myself, uh, uh, I thought disability was something that, you know, just meant some sort of, you know, that I was failing in the system, you know, that is not built for disabled people. So when I first got diagnosed with fibromyalgia, I struggled a lot to tell people that. I think this occurred for nearly a year, you know, and people just assumed that I was busy working. I was, I was bed bound and I was home bound to then. And then I, I slowly, I moved out of that crash, uh, but that still, you know, I had a lot of stigma uh, in my head of that situation. As it, you know, it is a highly stigmatized illness, and, and I was afraid of telling people that I had fiber. You know, what will they think? You know, will they think that maybe I'm taking it because having an invisible illness is is is, is, is complex. It's a complex experience. You know, people have a really hard time handling human vulnerability that they cannot see um yeah i'm sorry i got lost <laughs> no no many things so, so <laughs> yeah yeah but identifying as it sounds like the kind of summary of what you're saying is that oh i didn't know yes 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 exactly and but when i uh, uh developed long covid then you know having 
a multi-system chronic illness that severely affected, you know, several aspects uh, of my life, my entire life, basically, uh, forced me to educate myself uh, a lot about ableism and internalized ableism and it faced this values that, you know, I had for such a long time, you know, it just, you know, shielded myself from it. Um, and I, and that really set me free, you know, to be able to tell people, I, there's, it's not everything that I can eat. I, gluten really makes me extremely ill. And, and that's a thing, you know. And I, it, I, sometimes I just, I can't think uh, straight and I will exit the conversation. And, and that's okay, you know, and I, now I feel comfortable saying these things, but before I didn't. And I am very proud that I can say, like, I am disabled. These are the things that I can do. These are the things that I cannot do. And this is what I need in order to feel comfortable and you know, achieve my well-being. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so changing tact a little bit, um, we've got a couple more questions and then we'll jump into the Q&A. But um, bird conservation, um, looking after birds and their habitats um, will succeed uh, when we have everybody um, on board doing this work and part of this work. Um, what does conservation mean to you? And are there any barriers that um, impact your participation in bird conservation initiatives? Yeah, so conservation to me is, I think, reconciliation in the sense of we need to reconcile and reconnect uh, with nature. I, I think the perception that uh, natural environments and nature need to be devoid from human influence is, is a very flawed one because in the moment that we assume that and that we aim for nature and natural spaces that are devoid of human influence, we are saying that we are raising indigenous peoples, right? And we are raising a very rich and strong history of living in an environment in contact with nature, understanding nature, and, and you know, having that relationship in which, you know, you are part of the environment. We are part of nature. We need to learn how to contain ourselves, you know. Um, so I think my point of view of conservation is taking into account intersectionality and taking into account, you know, all of the systemic barriers that keep people disconnected from nature and keep people, you know, disconnected from I will support a politician and I will support policy making that benefits, you know, people, nature, health, education. Because birds don't believe in a bubble. You know, they, there's not this vacuum in them birds. <laughs> um, so we really need to work with people and, and be better with people and with people and, and meet them where they are. And I am well aware that that's uh, not the concept of conservation that has been applied in, in many places, but I do believe that that is the way forward for us. We need to do different. Uh, what we are doing is not working. I, I don't have all the answers, so, thankfully. <laughs> I don't want that responsibility either. <laughs> um, okay. Um, 
by the way, um, if anyone here, I, well, we know folks here um, with fibromyalgia or other chronic illnesses, there is going to be a quick this little survey at the end of this webinar. We really hope you fill it out because we're asking you there for your tips and tricks about birding with chronic illnesses so that um, we at BirdAbility can create um, a really great resource on our webpage for more people to um, learn um, about birding with chronic illnesses and um, and things that might work for them if they're new to birding or if they're new to their chronic illness. Um, so please keep sharing them in the chat or, or fill them in at the little survey at the end of this webinar. And I'll be collecting those answers and Leticia's um, experiences as well. Hey, Leticia, one more thing before we go into the Q&A. Um, a lot of folks with disabilities and other health concerns get asked some really inappropriate and um, invasive questions or say some, people say some really, not okay stuff and sometimes they're just genuinely curious but um, these questions are just often they're invasive and it's it's not the right time meeting someone out birding is definitely <laughs> not the right place to ask them for the first time um, questions that are inappropriate and so um, just to let you all know folks I spoke to Leticia about these ahead of time and she gave me permission to um, ask them or, or mention these things um, but these these are red flagged so here's my red flag. Um, I will wave it so that you get a visual prompt that this is not okay to say um, to someone with a chronic <laughs> illness or someone who you don't even know if they have a chronic illness because often you can't see it. Um, so here's the first one. Uh, Leticia, you said fibromyalgia causes chronic pain. How do you live like that? I couldn't. Rough. What, what's that supposed to so mean? Terrible. Oh, I got so sad. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, all right. I can't believe that sometimes you're so smart and sometimes you say you just can't think straight. You don't even look sick. Are you just pretending to get out of work? Yeah, we get, we get a lot, a lot. And, and with long COVID being um somewhat novel illness uh in, in people just a lot of people still don't know uh much about it there is a lot of misinformation out there so and, and that is true for many chronic illnesses that the toll is on the patient uh, to explain you know hey yeah this is this is the front of the package but there is a lot going on inside yeah, and you said before, just believing people when they tell you what they need. Like, don't question it. Just, just believe, right? Yeah, um, it's just simple. And then um, you have two chronic illnesses. Chronic meaning they're not going anywhere, right? So, um, well, get well soon. Uh, it's meant well, but... I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> not great huh what what should someone say yeah, it's, instead it's they're trying really to be kind great. the number they, i i think um people can tell you ask you you know how are you or even if you're chronically ill i mean you can tell people oh you you look very good today but that's a, that's okay is it is it a good symptom day for you how are your symptoms today uh, I think making the assumption, I think it feels a lot like uh, I am projecting a reality. And uh, I, ho I hope you get better. No, I'm not getting better. It's been over 600 days and there is a lot that is, it seems like it's not going away. So let me, let me maybe talk about it if I want, it, or let's not talk about it. You, do, you don't need to say, I hope you are feeling better you just mm -hmm. don't yeah 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 it's 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 definitely coming from a kind place but it doesn't necessarily feel good to receive it huh yes yes yeah yeah yes. so we're I'm, I'm about to jump into the q a session um the, the q a the questions that have come in so folks if you do have questions please stick them in the q a box because it makes it a lot easier for me to find the questions in amongst all the awesomeness coming in through the chat um Thank you, Leticia, for, for sharing all of this and all your experiences. And I have seen, I, it's hard for me to keep track of the chat, but I've seen a few things pop up where people have been really grateful for you sharing your attitude and your 
um, your um, approach to to dealing with some really tough stuff. Um, so I, I, it sounds like you, Thanks, you may have inspired a few folks today with just just the way that you the way that you are. Um, oh, thank you. Before before we before I go into those questions, is there anything else that you would like to share with folks? I know um, I know that you and I spoke a little bit about dogs um, earlier. Oh, right. Um, yeah, controversial topic. <laughs> Let's spark some some some. Fun. Um, yeah, I think when uh, we talk about accessibility in general, and we at Freya and I were discussing uh, the, the issue with dogs um, earlier, and I, I would explain that uh, a little better. But my point is that um, being chronically ill and disabled is extremely expensive, my God. And your income is also reduced uh, because of the amount of work that you can do. Um, so that takes a lot of, uh, you know, adapting uh, your life um, in so, so many ways. And adaptive equipment of any kind, and I don't want to call a dog an adaptive equipment, but sometimes, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, um, they do offer um, a lot of services and getting an an ADA certified uh, animal, for example, uh, fully trained is, is extremely expensive. Uh, not everyone can afford. Um, there is certainly an issue with misuse of uh, emotional support animals, but some people do need service dogs for all sorts of uh, different functions and some people with invisible illnesses and uh, invisible disabilities that need support animals and need service animals that might bring these animals uh, for bird outings, you know. Uh, I, I, and I, the answer if we reach the point that it gets complicated because uh, first uh, the person with the animal uh, might be, you know, be frowned upon, which is why are you in this habitat, you know, harsh, where I'm not talking about an extremely sensitive uh, endangered species nest inside, but I'm talking about, you know, just birding in a natural habitat. Uh, and uh, you have a service animal that, uh, isn't necessarily an official service animal because there is an access challenge to getting an accredited service animal. You know? So there is a it's a it's a, a a problem with multiple layers of accessibility. You have financial accessibility to you know adaptive devices and even things that include uh, increase the animals access uh, and, and facilitate people's lives like service dogs. And, and there are these barriers, you know, this, this things gatekeeping people from accessing these things in public uh, spaces. So I, I think it would be very nice to have a discussion on how to accommodate as a community uh, people that do need to have support animals with them. Um, how can we accommodate that as, as a community and how we can educate people on, you know, service animals, support animals, and, and including the handlers. Yeah, yeah, really interesting, interesting point. And, um, and just are, just are like dependent, right? Sorry, I, I don't. I think my um, maybe my I internet or got a little funky there. But but um, no no. Thank you for sharing that about about service animals and emotional support animals and and not being able to necessarily access the access the certification. But dogs can be an access need um, for folks and right. maybe 
maybe when you um if you're organizing bird outings just saying you know well-behaved dogs are welcome like that could be a way to in, signal to folks if you have a service animal that if they're not well behaved that okay that's a different issue but if they are then they can come because we know that some people need these to be able to participate um yeah thank you thank you for um for that um yeah. i just I, I just saw a message um leticia i think maybe your internet is having a hard time so if if you wanted to turn off your video if that might make it helpful i know it's kind of coming on and off oh my you know um okay so now we've got yes this is beautiful photo instead um but um you're still here so hey so i've got some questions um from the q a thank you everyone for um sending these in okay um let's see um um so someone said is it better now because uh i'm sorry Frey, i i changed the two um why i'm out of wi-fi so it should be better okay so I can okay. I can keep video. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's lovely to see your face. Um, um, so here's a question. Um, Leticia, I'm sorry that you now experience long COVID along with fibromyalgia. Did you experience light sensitivity before you had long COVID? I'm now light sensitive since I've been diagnosed with chronic dizziness. I can't tolerate shadows and shade, like at the same time where there's a high contrast between the, the shadows and the shade, but I enjoy just talking to the birds that I see. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love um, that. Um, so, yeah. I did not have like, yeah, I did not have light sensitivity uh, before on COVID, but I do experience episodes in which I am, uh, in general, sensory sensitive. So uh, it comes the, the full package usually when it comes and it's light and sound. So I do have uh, sound. I, I wear earplugs and sound on some headphones and um, a night mask and just um, eliminate every single sensory input. Uh, sometimes like even touch. Uh, I had a, a terrible flare between November and April, and I, I couldn't bear being touched because uh, it caused pain, uh, mm -hmm. sensory input. You know, it takes energy to process and it causes pain sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, someone, and one of one of our um, volunteers, one of our birdability captains wrote a really great piece on the birdability blog. Um, she's autistic and she goes birding with noise cancelling headphones a lot because the sound of many birds, she said cardinals and wrens are the worst because they're so loud and so constant, but it's just too much and wearing um, noise cancelling headphones allows her to go and enjoy the birds. Um, so if mm. anyone's interested in that, go check that out because it was really interesting to read about. Um, yeah, and I know um, just one I, thing. my my husband is autistic, and um, I learn a lot from him, and, and he questions a lot of my internalized ableism as well, because uh, he goes birding with me because I, I need to have a, a companion, uh, and he the the sensory input of looking for binoculars for him is, is oftentimes unbearable. So he cannot enjoy birds through lens at all. It just doesn't work for him. And he enjoys that experience in a completely different manner. And sometimes I catch myself trying to impose my way of birding into him and he's like, just no, no. <laughs> Let me do my thing, and I'm like, oh yes, I'm doing that thing that I'm not supposed to do. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Even even when you know someone so well and you go birding with them a lot, you you're still sort of doing that without even without even meaning to. So that means that folks who maybe yes. aren't used to that need to really be thinking about how we what assumptions we make about how others want to enjoy birds and be out in nature. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 
a lot of people who have light sensitivity, my background as an occupational therapist is in um, blindness and low vision services. And a lot of low vision conditions um, create a lot of glare sensitivity. So people wearing caps inside, so the light isn't shining right into their eyes or sunglasses, things like that can really help. Or just taking time between changing, um, you know, from a outdoors, like br- out in a bright car park into a shopping center that's just going to be darker and just giving yourself a minute or two to kind of, let your eyes and your brain get used to that. I know they're strategies that people can sometimes um, find helpful. Um, um, Let's see. Uh, How do you deal with the mental or the emotional um, aspect of having lost uh, some of your previous life as you once knew it um, do you get frustrated by what you can no longer do or or have you kind of come to terms with with your with what what with what your life looks like now that's an excellent question um, it's been a process uh, to be honest I I've I think, you know, life grew, life grows, I said this graph of the life growing around grief. Uh, and I think grief just stays the same, you know, it's, it's the same size. And, and I grief a lot in my previous life. I grief a lot of, uh, you know, loss of independence, loss of uh, spontaneity. I just, I cannot walk being spontaneous. I just, it's something that, doesn't it's not part of my world anymore. uh and when you think about all of the the moments you know that come to your life because of, let's just get out of the house and do this cool thing no I, I can't i need to pick up my energy budget and whether or not that will give, have health consequences to me so there is a lot uh to think through and process. Uh Uh-oh, internet troubles again. You read uh, everything in your life. You need to rethink your routine. You need to rethink your job. You need to rethink how much stress you take in, how much information, everything. So it's it, it's a lot of change. It takes a lot of time. And I'm trying to give myself a lot of grace in this process, uh, especially with uh, symptom management and management, how much I can do within a day. Uh, and if I overdo, there is a lot of frustration uh, behind it. And sometimes, uh, you know, there is just a crash for no reason, no particular reason. I just have to learn to let go of having control of some things. And that's a, a massive shift in, in mindset, in how I live my life. So it's, it's been a process. In, and, sure. and I'm trying to uh, bring back, uh, adapt things that were my passions before. I'm letting go of some that are completely inaccessible to me right now and, and trying to, to build new ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's a lot. It's a lot, um, a lot to deal with. Yeah. Definitely. But it, I, as, as someone, as, I, I saw a few people had said in the chat and, I, I, I noticed the same thing you, you, um, it looks like from at the, from the outside that, um, you give yourself a lot of grace and that's got to be the a really important thing. You're not, it, it looks like you're not beating yourself up too much about this, which is a good thing. Um, just I get, it I think what it is. I, I do, but I have to be honest that I deal with a lot of anger. I have a lot of anger. I have anger because I got sick uh, because my partner was an essential worker. And when the pandemic, we were first waivers and 
that we have to fight every single step of the way to have our wellness recognized. We have to be the ones that basically manage our own care. And there's so much that goes into planning our lives to, to enable us to have our basic needs met uh, that it's just, it enrages you the, the lack of a social systemic, you know, support, you know, that there is mm -hmm. no policy in place at this point in the game to support people with uh, post-infection illness. It's a major failure of our society in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking forward to seeing that improve for sure. Hey, one one last question um, from the audience. Um, so if someone's leading an outing or, or a big sit or, or some kind of bird related program, um, what is the best way for them to ask about what is needed or wanted by the participants in order to help them participate? Um, what um, Or what would you want um, an outing leader to ask the group or um, to ask you um, so that you can let them know what you need? I think you, uh, there are some basic things that you can uh, do upfront, I think, to remove the, the burden of having to uh, explain all of that, all, all access needs, right? Uh, so, for example, if uh, your outing, where is your outing? You know, describe your outing. Uh, can you foresee access challenges and can you be upfront about it? And can you be upfront about how you're going to support people in that way? And leave a channel so that people can let you know what their needs are in case their needs are not met by, you know, the the homework that you have done, uh, given the circumstances of the event that you're planning. The other thing that I believe people really need to put more thought into is into financial access. How much does it cost to get there? How much does it cost to be there? Do you have to be off work to be there? Uh, all those things. So who is going to, you know, are you someone's caretaker? Um, all those things, you know, have to be taken into consideration and financial access is a taboo to, to be discussed in this thing. It's, it's the very last discussion. It keeps a lot of people out, you know. Will people be able to eat? Do they have proper clothes to dress for the environment? All, all those things. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and when... Um nature centers and, and bird clubs and whoever can help remove those financial barriers um, to access. For sure, it helps um, more people participate. Providing childcare or stating ahead of time that yes. kids are allowed on this bird outing so you can bring your kids if you're looking yes. out for them or that kind of stuff. Like it's it's it, it may be the difference between someone being able to attend or not. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for all that. Um, uh, I know, I know that the way, the way I do it when I'm leading accessible outings is I say um, ahead of time in the outing description, if you have any um, accommodation needs, please, you know, here's my email address, please let me know ahead of time. And then at the start of the outing, I say if anyone has any, uh, needs any help or, or um, has any um, access needs that they would like us to all be aware of, if it will help you, please, you know, feel free to share them with the group after you share your name and, and pronouns and that. Um, or if I'm meeting someone one-on-one, -on -one, I just say, hey, like, you know, you're not required to be an expert on every single disability. Like that wouldn't be fair unless that was your job. Um, but but most most bird outing leaders aren't going to be. That that's not the that's not the idea. But if you say something like, hey, what do you need from me to help you participate mm -hmm. the way you would like? Let people tell you, trust them when they tell you what they need. And um, they're the experts on themselves. So ask them and they'll, they'll tell you if they need something. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to, you know, have all the bases covered in yes, every scenario. Yeah. Like just be guided by yeah. the people that you're trying to serve. I know that's a word you used previously in another conversation we had. 
you're trying to serve yeah. these folks, right? Yeah. Um, and when yeah. you have that mindset, um, it, it might change the way that you kind of approach it as, a, as an outing leader or um, interpreter or a program provider. Wow. Thank you so much, Leticia. It's, this has been such a um, valuable and um, enlightening conversation. I, I, yeah, I'm, it's hard for me to keep track of the chat, but I've seen more comments pop in thanking you for sharing and sharing your vulnerability as well as your, um, your approaches and your tips and tricks. And Thanks, um, everyone, and for listening. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And folks, if you um, if you miss some of this, or if um, you know someone else who would benefit from this, the recording will be up on the American Bird Conservancy and the Birdability YouTube channel uh, channels, two channels, um, probably by the end of this week. Um, and we've got a couple more in this series. So the next um, episode will be uh, the first Tuesday of January same time same place you have to register for it separately though and um, I'll be speaking with Caris Asportas who is an autistic birder um, and a member of the LGBTQIA plus community and Carrie has um, a lot to share and has taught me a lot um, about um, about folks um, in the autism community and neurodivergence and um, how to be more empowering and and welcoming so um, that will be another um, really awesome Really awesome thing to tune into. Um, once again, I'm just going to stick the um, the link in the chat. If you, as a nonprofit, again, um, Birdability really appreciates any donation, big or small. So if you'd like to help us continue to share the joys of birding with people who have disabilities or other health concerns, um, there's a donation link. Um, really genuinely appreciate any donation um, that you could make. And these um, Birdability t-shirts, um, I can't really show you the back properly, but it's got a good thing on the back. There's a good photo of it. Um, they're on sale until Friday. So if you want to get hold of a short sleeve t-shirt or a long sleeve t-shirt or a hoodie, um, those those funds um, go, the, the funds, the proceeds go directly to Pertability to support our work in this. So thanks. Um, thank you again, Leticia. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you, um, Mary thank Bergen you. Conservancy. Um, it's yeah, I look forward to learning more from you, Leticia, and um, I wish you all the best um, as you thank you. Thank through. you, Leticia. Thank you from us as well. Um, I've been reading through the chat as you were talking, and one of the things that kept coming up is um, with fibromyalgia in particular. A lot of the people in the chat were saying that it's such a, a a new diagnosis for a lot of healthcare providers. It just doesn't get the recognition um, that a lot of other health concerns do. And it's difficult. Um, I, I know from just reading about it some that it's difficult for a lot of healthcare providers to diagnose. And so there was a lot of gratitude in the chat for just speaking about that particular illness um, and how you cope with it. Thank you, thank you. And please connect. Uh, I'm on Instagram, Twitter. Oh, what's what's yeah. your Instagram handle so folks can connect with you? Oh, it's like. that uh, Leticia Saurus. It's just how serious is my name? <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> it's a like dinosaur. Leticia Saurus. I can I can L E T I can send it to you. There we go. Yes, yes, I just followed you, Leticia, on Twitter. Thank you so much, everyone, and thanks to thanks again, our Leticia. interpreters, Paula and Kathy as well, and to Erica. Bye, everyone. Thank you.